Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Now, here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us on this Thursday evening as we're going to be discussing public policy issues that are of interest to you, the viewer. Because this program belongs to you and because the legislators who appear on it are answering your questions, we call it by that fancy name, Your Legislators. We want to invite you to call in your questions electronically. <coughs> Uh, the phone number will be on your screen. You can send them to us on our web page or by email. And then we are now joining the Twitter generation. You can, uh, you can Twitter us at Your Legislators using the Your Legislators hashtag. And there's discussion and, and uh, further details about that on our web page. We're still, other people may have figured it out. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> but, but we're going to get it figured out. And we're looking forward to uh, using that as one more vehicle for our viewers to interact with us. As we do each week, beginning in early January and continuing until whenever the legislature goes home, we begin our program by introducing our distinguished panel of guests who will help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. We begin with, from District 40A, Brooklyn Park, and I think we just decided that even though you've been in the legislature a number of years, you might this is your first time with this us? This is my first time with us. Representative Michael Nelson. Representative Nelson, we're delighted that you have uh, joined us this evening. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, what you do when you're not in the legislature, the committees you serve on, things of that sort. Um, like I said, I've been here in the legislature 10 years. This is my 11th year. Um, I, was, I ran originally in a special election when my uh, left Darlene Luther passed away, and um, lost that special election, but won that election, won that fall, and Denny, Denny and I came in at the same time. I'm a carpenter by trade. I worked for many years, both in the private sector and, and for uh, public sector as a carpenter. Um, worked as a business agent for the Carpenters Union, and recently retired. So I'm uh, now just serving in the legislature. Well, we're delighted that you've joined us, and, and uh, thanks for making some time for us. Joining us, uh, another um, uh, Regular guest, someone who's been with us many times from District 65 in St. Paul, Senator Sandy Pappas. Senator Pappas, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Even though you're a regular, tell our viewers about yourself. Well, I represent St. Paul. Um, I've raised my children in St. Paul. I have three daughters, now all married, and 15 grandchildren. That's my claim to fame. Um, I was this year elected Senate President, so that's a new role for me. And I chair the corresponding committee to the committee that Mike chairs, uh, state mm -hmm. and local government. And so we can collaborate on state and local, local government things. Well, we're delighted that uh, you're with us here again. Uh, another regular guest on our program, been with us many times, District 47, Chan Hassan, <coughs> Senator Julianne Ortman. Senator Ortman, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Yeah, Anderson, thanks for having yeah. me back. I'm Julianne Ortman. I live in Chan Hassan. Uh, I represent most of Carver County, and I've served in the state Senate and s since uh, 2003. Um, I've always served on the tax committee. That's an area of interest I've always, always had. And also on the Judiciary Committee, I am an attorney. I've been an attorney for many years, had my own law firm for many years, practiced in uh, Virginia and D.C. before coming back to Minnesota where I grew up. And I also have a brand new committee this year, the Higher Ed Committee. And there are four good reasons for that. There are Raymond, Ellie, William, and Sam, and they're 21, <laughs> 20, 18, and 14. And I really learned how complicated and expensive it is for folks to go to college oh. these days. So it's a great new committee assignment. I'm happy to have it. And speaking as someone who's the father of a recent law school graduate and someone who's uh, recently entered college, I second that motion. <laughs> so. All right. And finally, another frequent <coughs> guest with us, District 54B from Hastings, Representative Denny McNamara. Representative McNamara, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Barry, uh, I came to the legislature at the same time, Representative Nelson and Senator Ortman, uh, 10 years ago in 2003. And so I've served five. This will be my sixth term, I yeah. guess, actually, in the House now. I've always served on the environment committees. Uh, I'm the lead on environment finance, so I uh, work with Representative Leganius and look forward to uh, 
the challenges in our environment arena as we go forward, and I'm glad to be back. All right, well, let's jump right into it. Well, we've got two questions that touch on tax questions, and so I'm going to throw them both out there and, and uh, ask our panel to address those and maybe talk generally about the governor's tax proposals. A viewer from Hermantown wants to know whether or not the panel supports the governor's proposal to lower property taxes, and another viewer from that famous Minnesota town, unidentified city, um, <laughs> says that sales taxes on clothing just simply uh, cause uh, people to go out of state. Uh, this viewer opposes the sales tax extension and wants to know what the panel thinks. So let's start there. Maybe Senator Pappas will start with you. I think you're I'm happy to. Um, I actually spent many happy years on the tax committee and was vice chair of the tax committee about a decade ago. So I still am very interested in tax issues. I am mostly very satisfied with the governor's tax plan. I think the, uh, the reform in it, broadening the base broadening and lowering the sales tax rate, I think some property tax relief. And actually, I think that the approach to the tax on clothing, uh, which is broadening the base, is, um, is the sound one. The first $100 uh, purchase, uh, uh, an item that was under $100, items would be exempt from the tax. It would only be uh, taxed items that were more than $100. So it makes it very progressive because most people don't, you know, spend over $100 on one item of clothing. Um, so I think it's a good plan. And it also is, uh, will help us get our fiscal house in order because there's kind of no gimmicks, no mirrors, no pushing it off into the future, but looking at what our financial needs are and raising the revenue to provide those services. Senator Orban, your thoughts? Well, your first viewer asked about uh, lower property taxes, and I think the, the governor has made a terrible mistake with his uh, property tax proposal. It doesn't really lower anyone's property taxes. So what he has proposed is to give the cities more LGA, some of our cities, and our counties, county program aid, to hopefully offset their, their, uh, their expenses. But at the same time, the sales tax burden would be imposed on all of those cities and counties, and they would have to pay all those service uh, sales taxes. So I have one city, the city of Waconia, that would have to have paid $279,000 more in sales taxes to have met their annual budget last year. And so what these cities are seeing is you can give maybe a little bit more aid, but it's offset completely by all the sales taxes that would be imposed. And then there's a, an added burden of paying those sales taxes. So um, in, in addition to that problem with it, there's this rebate that's being proposed of $500. But it's, it's, a, it's a very strange proposal to go to every property taxpayer. But property taxpayers don't pay the same across the state of Minnesota. It depends on what the value of your home is. It depends on where you're located. So a township <coughs> property taxpayer in rural Minnesota might pay $150 a year in annual property taxes, where somebody in the suburbs might pay $5,000 a year. And so they all, under the governor's proposal, would get $500 in rebate. Generally speaking, I think it's a really bad plan to raise sales taxes and income taxes on Minnesotans and then turn around and select certain property tax owners uh, to give a rebate to. So there, there are a lot of problems with the governor's proposal. I think that's why we haven't seen any bills yet, even though it's past the deadline for him to introduce those bills. President McNamara? Well, well, Barry, I think uh, there's some of the governor's proposal that I do like, and there's a lot of it that's troubling. The broadening of the base is, is a good idea. Today, uh, Minnesota has one of the most narrow sales tax in the nation, and uh, the idea of broadening the base is a good idea. Um, but the reality, some of the business-to-business -business and other tax increases are really regressive, especially on uh, middle class and, and lower uh, income folks in Minnesota. So the idea that we broaden the base, if we had a corresponding lower of the rate, that would be okay. But the net effect is in the governor's proposal, the broadening the base and the lowering of the rate that he's really done is not equal. We'd have to lower the rate down in the neighborhood of about 4% to get to where it really would be a net zero increase for Minnesotans. It's a huge tax increase at this time. It's really hard for a lot of Minnesotans to accept. So we're going to have some good discussion. I think Senator Hartman made a good point. We're still waiting really to see how it all works out, but uh, we do have to find uh, the answers here going forward, and hopefully we can in something that's better and more acceptable to the hardworking Minnesotans. And I guess I'm going last. It's uh, for the first time I'm serving on the property tax division in, in, the, uh, in the House, and so I haven't been on the tax committee before, but something I've said from the very beginning when I first ran when they talk about taxes and we're going to raise my taxes, it's not about taxes, it's about the services. We as 
as a, uh, citizens want our government to provide for us. And we need to pay for those. And we haven't been doing that in a fair way the last 10 years, going back to the Ventura administration. And so we've had this constant the last 10 years. Every two years, we have a deficit. Well, the governor is, well, I don't agree with all the parts of it and, and, and would maybe have done it differently if it was I, myself writing the bill. Um, he's trying to balance that out, get us on a, on a path so that we have a balanced budget going forward, and not just this year, but for the next two years after that. And, and then we can look at doing what we need to do to adjust some of the things to make the tax system work fair, be fair and work for everybody. One of the great things about this program is that we have viewers who pay careful attention to issues and sometimes ask some pretty technical but interesting questions. <laughs> uh, and I've got one here for our panel. I'm not sure you can answer it. Uh, uh, it's your get out of jail free card in advance in case you can't. I want to know uh, how much my tax burden is going to be. Yeah, right? well, <laughs> this viewer's got an interesting question, and the viewer's concerned about what, what the viewer calls the split class commercial slash residential property tax. And this has to do with taxes generally assessed against property owners where there's a residential component as well as a business component. And this viewer notes property taxes increased in some cases more than doubled. The problem goes back to 2002. While other property taxes were going down, there was a bill introduced to correct this. It, had, it was uh, vetoed. And this viewer is wondering if there's been any discussion about that issue and if that issue might be coming up in this legislative session. Anybody know anything about that? You tax committee people. Yeah. That's a, it's a pretty complicated question. Um, but if it was in the tax bill two years ago, I know in the Senate, um, we have been looking very closely at putting those provisions back in and bringing them back into an omnibus tax policy bill. The property tax system is very complicated with 50-some different classifications mm -hmm. for property. A, a lawyer couldn't figure it out. A specialist <laughs> couldn't figure it out. And so we have an awful lot of work to do to simplify the tax code, and especially the property tax system. There was a working group for property taxes that has made some very important recommendations, and, and those recommendations will very much be considered. So your viewers should actually weigh in on that issue and let us know what kind of reforms, in addition to that one, we should consider. And as, and as a newbie on the tax committee, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to look at that, that report that's come out and, and judging how we're going to do the taxes. But, you know, we need to have a fair tax system for everybody. Um, in Minnesota, my understanding is that we tax um, residential property at a lower rate because we want people to stay in their homes. Um, my mother, for nine years, uh, lived in Wisconsin. And then she had, it took her 10 years living back here on a smaller home for her taxes to reach what they were in Wisconsin. Because in Wisconsin, they tax, if it's a $100,000 property, it's taxed the same rate, whether it's a business, whether it's a factory, whether it's somebody's, re somebody's residence. And so that's the way they do it there. But we have, ta we have lower taxes. We, we want people to stay in their homes and be able to afford to stay in their homes. And so we've had lower tax rates on residents, and, and that's kind of been the, the, the policy we've had here. So I, th I think that's a good policy. There is a question here that we discussed last year, and uh, I think, Senator Orton, you and I might have had a little conversation about this uh, last year, and it had to do with the so-called uh, Internet tax or taxes on transactions that people purchase from Amazon and other in providers outside of the state of Minnesota, and I think that was part of the governor's proposal. Yeah. So just, I'll just look at you and say, do uh, you have any views on that, anything uh, about whether that might go anywhere this session? Well, first of all, I don't think Minnesotans want to pay more on internet purchases. Um, there are some, some interesting policy questions that come out of that, but I think uh, it really ultimately is a federal issue, and I'd like to see our, our Congress act that way so that all states have the same treatment for all these different purchases. In the short run, what's been happening is state by state they've been trying to address this problem, and they've been passing <laughs> legislation to try and um, impose taxes, but there have been lawsuits going back and forth about whether or not there's a sufficient relationship between the, uh, the person actually being asked to uh, collect the tax and the state of Minnesota. So I, I don't really want to get involved in the litigation. I've been trying to avoid that, but I, I think that there's an awful lot of pressure to do this from some of the retailers in the state. There is, and I was at a meeting with small businesses, the Main Street Fairness, uh, they call it, uh, where because it's so difficult for them to compete with the Internet retailers, and yet they're the hometown businesses in your community that support the local baseball team and um, support the local charities, and uh, yet they have, to, uh, they have to impose these taxes. And if consumers decide to just order online, they don't have to pay mm -hmm. the taxes. So there's really def there's definitely an unfairness there. And it is a, a tough one, Barry, if I can. Um, 
it's not really fair when you can go online and not pay the tax. That's, that's not the right way. But at the same point, as Senator Ortman said, it really is an issue that the federal government needs to address. It's not fair, the current situation. And if we can do something in Minnesota, I think it would be good. But I just hope that the federal government does move forward and fix this because it is unfair and unequal and it's a mess today. And what, what most people don't realize is that it's a sales and use tax. So even if you buy it online and you buy it and bring it to Minnesota, you're supposed to pay that tax. A lot of people don't. I know one of our legislators we served with in his first term got nicked because he had bought a lot of purchases online with his credit card and the Department of Revenue got him and he had to pay the tax on it. But most people don't do that. But that's, it's not just a sales tax, it's a sales and use tax. And we are responsible for that tax even if we're not charged it by the retailer. So but that, that, that most people don't do that. What most about if you buy have. a book on your Kindle? I mean, that's a whole nother yeah. electronic books that are not taxed. Well, one of the interesting little angles to this is the, um, is the circumstance where your smaller providers who are selling on the Internet um, uh, are concerned about um, the ability of the larger providers to pay the tax, and they aren't in a position. So, you know, the fairness issue can run multiple directions, which yeah. makes it, as you suggest, Senator Ortman, a very complicated question, best resolved by, or at least arguably best resolved by the, the folks in Washington. Well, there is a, another nuance to that, and that is the governor's proposal to tax digital downloads. As yeah. Senator Pappas was saying, if you download a book or you download music on your iPod, mm -hmm. the governor is proposing to pay a tax. I, I think that's an alarming change for folks that are 17, 18, 19, 20. I, I think they're going to be shocked at that proposal. So I think we better watch where that one's heading. We'll have more, t more opportunities to talk yep. about it, I think. All right, well, we've had a lot of discussion in the public eye over the last couple of weeks uh, about matters relating to gun control, and we have viewers who want to talk about it. We have uh, one viewer who just wants us to comment on it. We have another viewer who is uh, in favor of some kind of restrictions, although doesn't specify exactly, and then another viewer who just asks generally, after last week's hearings about gun control, can we expect to see any new regulations at the state level? So who wants to take a run at that first? It's actually it's, a, it's an issue that you know this, I'm from a suburb and we've have some have had some problems with with crime and and that but it's an issue that plays differently if you're from the outstate or from St Paul like Sandy Pappas is it's you know if, as I said if you wake up in the morning and you hear gunshots and you're in Minneapolis or St Paul you're afraid you're going to walk out and find a body on your front step if you're out in in uh, rural Minnesota you hear that gunshots in the morning you think somebody got lucky. And because they're out hunting, and and so it's a whole different culture, and it's and it's it's it, so it cuts differently across the state. Um, so the Supreme Court has ruled has, has ruled that we that we are allowed to have guns, but they and individuals are allowed to have guns, but they also said there can be reason there can be reasonable restrictions put on that right to have guns that are guaranteed by the Second Amendment. The question gets to be whose definition of reasonable is, is what it is, and that, that's what we're all fighting about here, what we're going to do at the state legislature. I was talking to someone who told me that she has a friend who is an NRA member, and he went to the hearings, and he was, you know, all upset, and he came away and he said, oh, th there was just a scare tactic there. They're not trying to take away my hunting rifles, and they're not trying to take away my small arms. Uh, so, you know, I'm, you know, I'm cool with this. I thought that legislators were trying to do that. So I think probably the only thing we might have a chance at, at passing is universal background checks. Um, the police are very much and the sheriffs are very much in favor of that. But in terms of restricting other guns, I, I really don't know that we have the votes to do that. Well, I, I don't support the universal background checks. I don't believe that all the sheriffs and the chiefs do. There may be some individual ones who have expressed that. Um, I don't support any restrictions on any types of ammunition or guns. The, the, the fact is that the Second Amendment is a very broad right. It's not a privilege. And so we have to accept the fact that Minnesotans and folks across the country have that right, and it has to be a meaningful right, just as we wouldn't want to impose on a First Amendment right or a Fourth Amendment right. We need to make sure that we manage that as a right. And any further restrictions really aren't necessary. Um, there are some things that we can and should be doing, which is more aggressive prosecution of gun crime. Those that shouldn't have a gun because they're already prohibited by law, we should be prosecuting that. So if there are straw man sales, if there are uh, 
uh, convicted felons, if there are those that have been adjudicated to be mentally ill um, in a court of law, they should not have guns. And if someone um, does get a gun like that, I think that gun should be taken away, and I think that there should be But that's the point of the background check to determine. I mean, light, rights, rights have limits. All our rights have limits. You can't cry fire in a crowded movie theater. That's not right. part of your freedom of speech right. The same thing with guns. They can, we can have limits. You can limit guns to children. You can limit guns to criminals. You can limit guns to mentally ill people. But how do you find those people mm -hmm. if you wait till after the fact and somebody's been killed? But if you allow for a background check beforehand, maybe you can, you can stop some of that and find some of that and stop and prevent those people from having guns. Well, if that background check that's being done now mm -hmm. was meaningful and all of those records were in the system, we might have a different conversation. But the fact is that it's woefully deficient. The NICS index that's being used, those records aren't in there from the across the country. Even in Minnesota, we're not getting those records in. So well, I think that's we a record on fixing problem then. Well, I you think know, that's not, we don't do it, we before, fix it. Before there's any other discussion of background checks, I think we should make sure that system is working because otherwise we're just talking about paperwork instead of having a meaningful, meaningful background check. And so I, I think we should be cautious before we do that. And I, I don't want to impose on the, the right of residents and individuals who legally own a gun to transfer that go gun to their neighbor or someone else. And so a universal background check would start to get at those kinds of transactions, and I, I don't think we need to do that. I think that's an imposition. I think it's more of an issue of gun shows than, well, and, and you know, also, it's than, also than an, passing on your gun down to your kid. And it's also an issue of mental health care. We've, mm -hmm. we've been woefully inadequate about well, how we spent on mental health care. We've been cutting that when we've been cutting the budget for the last 20 years. It's, that's one of the first places we cut. We need to get, make sure people have access to mental health care and get the treatment that they need. Because if you look at the, the shootings that have been going on, most of them have been cases of, of people with mental health issues that have gone out and done this. And if they had gotten the care they needed, we probably wouldn't be having the number of shootings we have. Barry, I don't think you're going to see anything in regards to guns. I think the vast majority of the legislature, this is Minnesota, our outdoor heritage and your personal protection and all that are so important to the folks in Minnesota. We realize how important those Second Amendment rights are. And I just don't think you're going to see anything. Is there a tweak maybe in the mental health or is there a gap somewhere? I think if there really is, we'll come together in a bipartisan way. This is one issue that will only happen if it can be done bipartisanly because for the reality, if you live in outstate Minnesota, you are not for any absolute any restrictions on the Second Amendment. And if you're in the suburbs like myself or Senator Ortman or pretty much uh, Representative Nelson too, though he's closer in than where we are. I grew up in Hastings. I'm sorry. Guns are really a part of our tradition. I grew up in a hunting family. I can't imagine restrictions uh, more. I, I don't see that happening. I don't believe it'll happen either, Tim. I, and it's not the right thing. I'm sorry. Right. I, I mean, agree with that. too many people fought and died for the freedoms we have in this nation. And boy, the Second Amendment is so strong. And Senator, I respect that maybe some people were in that those meetings and came away differently. But I walked from the hearing room that I was in, in room five, to go to the parking ramp just to retrieve something from my car. And I had four different constituents standing in line, and they were all pro-Second Amendment people that were. I mean, I haven't seen four constituents at the Capitol coming up from Hastings and Cottage Grove ever, and they were in line just in the part I was in. So it's a fired-up issue, Barry. <laughs> good, you know, good luck for it. I, I respect Senator. The reality yeah, is we live in the Wild West, yeah. and um, if people don't have just one gun for hunting and one gun for personal protection, but they have multiple, multiple guns and high-powered weapons and semi-automatic weapons that could kill three deer at once. I mean, it, when is there an end in sight? I mean, it's all part of a very violent culture that we live in. We have violent movies. We have violent video games. Um, we're, not, we're not a very peaceful country. But you don't want to impose on the rights of law-abiding citizens to get at those problems. I don't think it's imposing on their rights. Well, I suspect we'll have an opportunity to discuss this some more before uh, whatever, whenever the legislature goes home in May, I, I would think. A viewer from Hastings, as long as we're going to talk about uh, folks from uh, greater Minnesota who are concerned about uh, various issues, a viewer from Hastings is very concerned about the authority of the DNR. And this viewer says many sports people, and I think we're referring to people in the hunting and fishing uh, uh, recreational fields, feel that the DNR has too much authority, and what, if anything, is the legislature going to do about that? 
So we'll pick on you since well, it's from Hastings. Well, Barry, uh, Representative McNamara? <laughs> it's, it's in my committee the jurisdiction in the environmental arena, and we are constantly working with DNR to work on downplaying their overreach and really imposing on people. Um, I think sometimes the DNR looks at an issue and is thinking, well, somebody may uh, break this law, so let's make sure we got rules and regs that make it difficult on so many of the law abiding. And it's really kind of an inside baseball thing, but we've got rules and structure on uh, if you have game and what, how it, what position, what uh, way it's got to be transferred from, say, you're going hunting out in western Minnesota on your way back to Hastings and you've got ducks or pheasants, does it have the feathered head and the wing? And, and we have more restrictions sometimes in some of our bordering states. Um, there's some things we could work on to lessen the burden. Um, I think we are doing this. Some of the COs, the conservation officers, are going through some good training so they don't have this uh, we got you kind of attitude. We really do want to work on that. Um, um, to, to the uh, listener and the viewer from Hastings, I would strongly suggest, like a lot of these things, contact your legislator. In this case, if this individual would contact me. I've got a whole array of constituents in my mind who I think may have sent that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I very well uh, have talked to that individual a number of times already. Any other thoughts on the DNR issues? All right. Um, higher education. You touched on this, Senator Hartman, so let's start with you. Uh, 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 viewers concerned about the uh, cost of higher education and uh, expenses uh, that are, you know, incurred at the higher education level. What's, uh, if anything, is the legislature going to be doing about that this session? Well, for me personally, I'm, I'm also extremely concerned about the affordability and the accessibility of college for Minnesota students. And uh, we've had hearings with some of the regents and, and candidates and uh, the chancellor from Minsku. I have to say I'm a really big fan of Minsku and the alternative educations that they offer. I think one of the, the issues that we will be focusing on quite a bit are the, the Pell Grants, the state grants that are available to students in Minnesota that, that have need. Um, there's uh, there's a, a, a fluke in the system or a problem in the system, depending on how you look at it, where those Pell Grants aren't given in a, in a fair way to the part-time students. That there's definitely a preference in the system for full-time students, but there surely are an awful lot of students that need to work and can only afford to go part-time because they have this requirement to work. So we want to even that out, and I expect to see a, a fix of that problem. I, I think we shouldn't penalize students that are working full-time and, and going to school part-time. Um, I think there's going to be pretty good scrutiny of what happens with the University of Minnesota and the question about whether or not they have more administrators than other universities uh, in uh, across the country. Uh, the, um, the president has been to the Senate and has promised a very good study of that and to provide us more information. I think you'll see an awful lot of scrutiny on that. Um, I have asked for uh, uh, some information about the relationship between the tuition increases and the reductions that have come from the state. Mm -hmm. The chancellor for Minsku has said that they've worked very hard to make those reductions without raising tuition. And I, for one, would like to see you know, how, how they actually dealt with those reductions. I think we can reduce the size of Minsku and find some cost savings without raising tuition. And I think that's where most Min Minnesotans would want to see that, no tuition increases. Well, I think in more recent years, they've been more sensitive to tuition increases. But in the early years, as the legislature reduced funding to our higher ed institutions, they'd made it up mostly with tuition increase. Right. And so you were seeing 8, 9, 10 percent mm -hmm. tuition increase. And then that, got, that kind of got too much. So then they really had to look at efficiencies. And I think they, and certainly they can do more. Um, because you don't want to hurt the quality of the education that students have that's really important to them. So there would be, there would be institutions like Winona State where the students would say, um, I'm willing to pay more in tuition because the quality here is so important to me. And others, more like the two-year colleges, who of course want the quality, but they're more price-sensitive students that are more strongly wanting to keep the tuition increases down. But I agree with you. I think the part-time um, issue is, has not been addressed properly because it's a financial aid formula that the lower your income, the more you get in financial aid, and the more expensive the program is, the more you get in financial aid. And it doesn't take into account if you have a family and you have to work and you're going to school part-time, which more and more students are doing. Because you're working, then you're not eligible for financial aid. 
And I, I'm sure there's a way that we can look at fixing that proposal. You know, the only thing I'd want to add, Barry, I'm, I'm really impressed with President Kaler, and he's taken this issue of administration and how big it really is, and are we comparing apples to apples? The, uh, the Wall Street Journal report, uh, you know, you talk to some of those at the university, say, well, who we count as administration really aren't administrators as other schools look at it. And so I've been impressed with President Kaler and his saying, yes, we are going to look at it. We are going to really do what's the right thing for the university. Being a, a U of M person myself, I really want us to do that so we can answer to the state that, yes, we are putting our best foot forward in regards to the university. Well, and, and it, it, the, the, the concerns about the cost, I have three sons that have gone to college and, and, and all have got huge loans that they're having to pay back off with, and getting jobs. We also, with the Ministry of System, need to be concentrating more on the two-year programs and the one-year programs that can get people the training, because there's a lot of people that have, that have been out of the workforce, are now trying to get trained to get back into the new jobs that are there. And I think Minsky is real good at doing that, and we need to work on continuing to fund that, that we need to watch those costs. Any other thoughts? All right, we're going to go back to taxes. If you were from Thief River Falls. I have other thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, I take that back. It's a, strike that question. All right, a viewer from Thief River Falls wants to know, has the legislature considered raising taxes on alcohol? Representative McNamara, what do you think? Well, you know, actually, we just had that discussion um, in Ways and Means. We had, I'm trying to remember where Representative Khan, it was in Ways and Means we were talking about uh, how she was, uh, was in the presentation by Commissioner Showalter and talking about the governor's budget and the presentation was, well, the governor's included the 94 cents a pack cigarettes and why didn't we look at alcohol? I think you're going to see the legislature look at, I'll call them the sin taxes for lack of a better description. We have to realize, I think, as we look at that, I'm somebody who doesn't smoke and doesn't drink very much, so if they really raise those taxes up a lot, it doesn't personally affect me, but we have constituents of moderate means that may like to have a beer once in a while and may unfortunately have the habit of smoking and it is unbelievably aggressive. I mean this is, the, the cigarette is hundreds of millions of a dollar tax increase and a lot of it falls disproportionately but at the same point it's a tough issue. It really uh, reduces the number of young kids right. that go yeah. into smoke right. and boy I'll tell you mm -hmm. I personally as someone who voted for the last one whether you call it a what was it health impact fee mm -hmm. or a cigarette tax whatever it cut down on the young mm -hmm. kids but now that other as the prices have gone up I mean that's a tough one I think we'll see alcohol discussed yeah. I wouldn't be surprised in the end at all that it is maybe mm -hmm. in, the, in the mix in the mix right. yeah. I, I agree I, I said we're gonna look at everything I mean, when we're looking at the taxes, I mean, we're, the governor's got his proposal. Yeah, it's a starting point that we're going to look at. This is what he proposed that we're going to do. I think the, the Senate and the House is going to look at different ways of doing it, and the mix is going to come out, and it's probably not going to be exactly like what the governor does. Um, and the alcohol taxes, they're, they're limited that. With the cigarette taxes, uh, well, as it's been explained to me, there's a, you raise them, and you really don't, you know, you get less people smoking, so you really don't raise more income with them right. by raising them. But then you got the added benefit of less people smoking. So mm -hmm. if that's your goal, then you want to raise the taxes on the cigarettes to get them down so people don't smoke. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's very complicated. But I have to ask, you know, what's the goal? Yeah. I mean, I, I disagree with raising a tax to socially engineer someone's behavior. If we're going to raise a tax, it should be because we need the money for some government program. But the the current finances of the state of Minnesota are actually very sound. We have a billion dollar surplus. We had 114 million dollars in more revenue than was projected over the last two months. It's because of the fiscal discipline and so I don't see any reason to raise a tax at this point because we don't really need to add additional funding to our programs and the governor doesn't really do that. The only thing he does is take a bunch of new tax money and give it back out in these tax rebate checks. So I, I'd like to see his bill, but I, I have to say we have a very sound um, budget right now. We don't need to raise any taxes. The one that's interesting to me is the health exchange bill. With um, the requirement that we have a health exchange program, um, the Senate has decided to um, fund that through a cigarette tax. 
And I think that's interesting. Originally, it was a, a premium tax on people that, that mm -hmm. pay um, health insurance premiums. That was a very direct tax. If you change the plan and you ask people to pay the cigarette tax, you've got a whole bunch of people that will benefit from the health exchange program that won't be paying for that program and the cost of that program at all, and it will be subsidized by those very poor Minnesotans who pay for cigarette taxes, and that will be diminishing in terms, in terms of the revenues received. I think that's an interesting one for Minnesotans and viewers to watch. Will we actually use that cigarette tax to pay for the health exchange? And in the House bill, it's still the three, um, it's the three and a half percent, up, 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 well, it's up to three and a half, it's three and a half percent the first year, then it's up to three and a half percent after that. If we set up, if we get the bill passed and we get our state exchange passed, if we don't get the state exchange passed, it'll be we get we fall into the federal exchange, and that's a straight three and a half percent every year. So, and if that we, as we move forward on that, I would rather see us have a state exchange than have a federal exchange. And we we design the plan for Minnesota as opposed to having the federal government impose it upon us. But uh, the one thing I have to take a little bit umbrage at is that the billion dollar surplus. We may have a surplus in this year's budget, but next year's budget, which the governor is proposing, and what that's what these taxes are about, there's a, we're starting out with a billion dollars deficit, and we're at plus the billion dollars that we borrowed from the school. So to say we have a billion dollar surplus is kind of misleading. It's in this end of this year's budget, there may be extra money there than we than we projected two years ago. But the two years going forward, if we don't change the tax structure and do and and, and balance that out, we're going to have a, we're, we're looking at having to make more cuts. To make to get us to a balanced budget because we're projecting currently a billion dollar surplus plus we have to pay back the billion dollars that we borrowed from our schools so to say it was a billion dollar surplus is wrong. We uh, we're all over the place here right now, <laughs> Barry. But we I was going to say we do owe our schools money and um, the governor's uh, proposal, the governor's budget does have investment dollars in education and higher education in the state grant and in early childhood and. You know, and in other areas. Um, and then I did want to say about that health exchange, that's still pretty controversial within the Senate. So it has, the dust hasn't settled on how the health exchange is going to be paid for. Well, I would just go back to Representative the Senate, Nelson. The tax, the tax members did that, but the rest right. of us don't necessarily right. agree. <laughs> but uh, Representative Nelson, I just wanted to say we are in a, actually a pretty good fiscal condition. We, two years ago, balanced $5.2 billion in deficit without raising taxes. I think Minnesotans would like to see us find more reductions in state government. I'm all for tax reforms to make better policy, but I think we should separate those two things. And I think that's where the governor's budget really gets confusing because he's trying to do both tax reform and raise taxes and raise spending. And I think that's really hard for people to, to really grasp. And that goes back to something I said earlier about it's not about the taxes we pay. We, you know, we as, as citizens and the citizens of our, uh, in our districts have demanded certain services from our government. And we can have that discussion about what government, what services we cut, what we don't do anymore. Um, well, something we should be discussing every time we come in the legislature. That should be, we should have hearty discussions about that. But when we decide that these are the services we want, we want good schools, we want good roads, we want the, the snow cleared when it snows so we can get to and from work. When we decide these are the services we want, we need to pay for them in a fair way. And the governor's budget, well, like I said, even though I don't agree with a lot of some of his tax proposals there, the governor does that in a fair way. This is the proposal he's, he's putting forward, how we're going to pay for these services that Minnesotans have said they want. And it's a fair budget, and it's balanced not just the, the coming two years, but the following two years after that. We're not going to have a, a deficit there. We have a deficit in this next two years. We may be ending with a budget surplus at, at the end of July, but, but we're going to have a, a deficit that we're having to fix this year in our budget. Um, viewer from Brainerd wants to know uh, what's going to happen on raising funds for the Viking Stadium. You know you couldn't get out of here without asking <laughs> about the stadium question, right? Uh, I, I've been doing this program 24 years, and I think 20 of those 24 years we've had some question about uh, stadiums of some sort. Anyway, here we go again. What's the next step to raise stadium revenue if it's short? Does anybody uh, have any observations to share with us on that question? Well, I do have gambling under my jurisdiction in my committee. Um, but I'm, I'm a new chair in this area, and I'm, I'm new into the gambling arena. It's, it's the uh, electronic pull tabs that were authorized uh, to service the debt for the Viking, Cent for the Viking Stadium. Um, that, uh, you know, the stadium is still in design, so they haven't let any of the bonds yet for that. 
So you don't, we have a year for um, the companies to get up to speed in manufacturing and distributing and the bars to get the pull tabs and the charities to get all the electronic pull tabs, everything in place um, and then see how much money that raises. So I don't think we have to worry about it in terms of whether we have enough money to service the debt until next year. Well, I, I would say, Barry, uh, along those lines, we don't know yet how this is really going to go. The uh, electronic pull tabs are so new. Unfortunately, they're not starting as strong as we had projected, mm -hmm. but we're so far down on the curve moving up. At the very beginning, it doesn't look as good as we were hoping, but we don't really know where we're going to be. I, I think Senator Pappas is probably right. We're at least uh, till next year before we'll have a better clue what's going on. We do have a couple of small backups. Unfortunately, we probably don't have as much backup as we'd like. We have both a special uh, scratch off for Vikings that would generate a couple million a year and then a, a, a fee or a tax on the suites, I think, that generates a couple million that are in the language that can be. Uh, uh, they would they would be automatic, I believe, if I'm not like mistaken. Like a blink on. They, would, they, they would come on automatically if the need is there. But we may, I wouldn't be surprised if we may be back next year. Yeah. The the unsession, did the governor call it yeah. or whatever? That might be one of the issues that would be looked at in an unsession. <laughs> and, and, and as the stuff, the stuff that I've seen and, and, and heard about that in, with the stadium, with, with the electronic pull tabs is, per site, the revenue is higher than what they projected. Oh. But... They haven't had as many sites. There are right. only a third of the sites that they they projected they were going to have, and some of that was having to do with getting vendors yeah, uh, it's, authorized it's a, for the. It's an infrastructure issue. It's not that the, off, yeah the, vendors the authorized the to sell the to sell the it. products and and different products <laughs> out there. And so I'm concerned about it that it's not doing as well as they want. But I, I'm looking long term and and looking at the way these things have gone in the past. I think we're going to make it. But we need something we need to keep an eye on as we go forward. Any thoughts on that? I was going to say this is why many many of us thought that we should ask the Wilkesburg guarantee that if the revenues didn't meet the projections that the state of Minnesota wouldn't be held responsible. And so I think there are lots of good questions and we'll all be watching mm -hmm. it very closely. Senator Pappas, I just want to uh, touch on, uh, since you're uh, responsible of um, chairing that committee, we did have a question from a viewer who's anxious to expand gambling in various forms, although the viewer doesn't specify how that would what that would happen. Do you see any gambling expansion legislation coming through your committee this year? No. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts on that? If not, we move on. A viewer from Pope County... It's kind of like an auction. We can yeah. speak up or we're just going to keep rolling here. A viewer from Pope County wants to know um, about nursing home funding. This viewer is concerned about nursing homes and employees getting financial help. But the viewer also notes that rules and regulations are a concern and um, wants to know about that as well. Uh, who wants to take a run at the nursing home issue? Well, it'll be an interesting one because I think historically uh, Republicans have been somebody that really believes strongly in supporting our nursing homes and the funding. Uh, they do need some more money. It'll be interesting to see how that issue comes forward. Uh, many of the nursing homes, especially in rural Minnesota, are struggling, um, uh, and it's a tough issue, but uh, they definitely... I mean, you look at some of the folks working in these facilities are making less than what some of the folks working in fast food, mm -hmm. and that's just not right. So hopefully we'll find a way to get the, a little more money their way. Other thoughts? Move on. Viewer from that uh, famous Minnesota community, Unknown City. Um, this viewer wants to respond to the DNR question. The viewer thinks the DNR should get more money to get rid of um, uh, aquatic invasive species oh. and wants yeah. to know what the legislature is going to do about that issue. So we'll, well, we'll pick on you, uh, you uh, Senator yeah, McMurray. Yeah, you know, Barry, I'll, I'll roll with that. Uh, one, I was very surprised. Uh, uh, one fee increase, you know, last year uh, the Republicans worked in a bipartisan way, mostly Republicans, Senator Engelbertson and I uh, chaired the finance committees last uh, biennium, and we did uh, pass a much-needed uh, game and fish fee increase for hunting and fishing licenses, uh, and there was a push at that time from the DNR to also include a, uh, a boat fee increase for aquatic invasive species, uh, AIS, and there are a number of issues, zebra mussel, uh, you know, the Asian carp coming up and all that. Um, I was surprised the governor didn't include some kind of a fee increase for AIS. I think you'll see it uh, discussed, uh, and I think there'll be a strong push to potentially include that. 
Uh, it costs a lot, and we really, really have to uh, work hard both on the Asian carp one coming up the Mississippi and on the spread of zebra mussel. The reality is this stuff is here now, uh, and it's more a control. The University of Minnesota is going to play a very important role. Dr. Peter Sorensen at the university has done great work with common carp. We're hoping that can extend to Asian carp, zebra mussel, whatever. And so I think you'll see a real uh, increase in the funding to the University of Minnesota. I have a really silly question, is why can't we create a fishing industry around invasive carp? Uh, Senator, and some have produce it for food, yeah. and, or food fertilizer, or fertilizer, or animal food, cat food, or and that'll be some of the things the university will look at mm -hmm. as these fish come here. Is there a market? And they've done some of that in Illinois. Um, unfortunately, what's really sad is the market is for these fish as live, and we've had some cases where uh, folks have broke the law and moved them live because uh, some of the Southeast Asian. Uh, nations and folks have a tradition of having this fish alive and, and eat it that way or just have it real fresh so they want to move it live, they don't want it frozen and mm -hmm. so th that's uh, an issue that we have to work on. Unfortunately, we've actually like found sushi. Right, some being uh, coming across the border to Canada when they were still alive. It's really mm -hmm. scary stuff. Tough issue. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on aquatic invasive species? We're all in favor of not having them, or right? Not, yeah, not <laughs> having them, yes. Or eating them. Right. Yes. A viewer from Jackson wants to talk about, uh, and you know, one of the interesting things about this program, as I said earlier, is the, the knowledge and background of our viewers. And here's another question. I'm not entirely certain that I understand the question, but I'm simply going to ask it, and I know our panel will be able to help us. <laughs> I say every time I have been on this show, there's been at least one stumper. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, there, it's, there always is. There always <laughs> is. That's exactly right. Okay, this, this viewer from Jackson says, electric companies want to end... I think it's net meter, the net metering law. Mm -hmm. What is being done to prevent this? Um, somebody's going to have to help me with what the viewer's talking about in addition to answering the question. Can anybody help me with well, that? Well, Barry, uh, and I'm not sure what side of the issue the viewer is on, but net metering is if you, uh, I, I'll use the case, I'll, I'll pick on uh, former Channel 4 uh, newscaster Don Shelby. Uh, he's one of the folks that has some kind of energy producing facility in his home or on their property. Mm -hmm. Most commonly it would be either solar or a windmill. Mm -hmm. And we have a law in Minnesota that you get paid the retail rate back for that electricity if you or add to wind the grid. If you get that you add to the grid. grid. So mm -hmm. instead of there, if you envision the electricity getting used by your house when your windmill's really spinning or the sun's really shining on your solar, you've got excess, you're sending it out onto the grid. That's net metering. You get paid the full price. Some small electric co-ops throughout Minnesota are noticing that so many people are doing this that the people left, their retail rate of electricity is skyrocketing or potentially oh. can. And so they're saying maybe instead of net metering, paying the retail price for the electric, we should maybe be paying them back a wholesale rate because that's realistically the cost. So this is one of... We love windmills, we love solar, but are we, how much should we be subsidizing them? I mean, I need a, no. Yes, <laughs> Actually, right. I was familiar with it, but I would never have been able to answer the question <laughs> like that. So, so, so uh, should we answer the viewers? What, what is likely to happen? Anybody have a view on what's likely to happen on this session on that question, if anything? You know, Barry, I don't know if we're at the point now where we're going to begin to deal with it, but we're, I take that back. We should begin to deal with it because it's going to get to be a more serious <laughs> issue. What we need to do is look at, okay, should the people starting to come in start to ramp that down so we're not paying them retail? Because the reality, when we subsidize so many, somebody else has to pay for that, and there's some potentially small co-op, electrical uh, co-ops, that it could really adverse effect by just a few people on that the grid producing their own. Hmm. All right. Um, there's, your, there's your education in uh, yeah. electrical generation right. for today. Um, we have a viewer who's concerned about child support. And actually, we've got a couple of questions, uh, had a couple of questions last week on this. And, and the general tenor of the questions is concerned about whether or not the child support laws are fair and should be changed. Of course, uh, just to give a little background, there has been a substantial amount of work in this area by the legislature in previous years. Um, I don't know, Senator Urban, can I pick on the lawyer on the panel to talk about whether or not there's anything going to be said about this in this session about child support issues? There were uh, a couple of very controversial bills last year, and we never really reached a consensus on whether or not the current system is okay or should be changed. And I, I think 
Um, I, I don't know whether any other bills have been introduced this year. I don't know. But it reached a very unsatisfying conclusion for most people involved in that debate last year. More discussion this session, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, a viewer from Hills, Minnesota, wants to know about uh, payback to the schools um, uh, that was borrowed and, and when that's going to happen. Um, we have a proposal from the governor, and I suppose there will be some other discussion about that. Who wants to address that? Well, a billion dollars was already paid back to the schools this fall because the law said that as we had a surplus in, uh, that came to the state over and above a reasonable reserve, I can't remember what it was, maybe $500 million, then the next dollars go into uh, paying back the school shift. Uh, there still is quite a bit of money left to go, and now I think the districts are more interested in actually having cash in hand than getting paid back the loan. And so more realistically, we'll pro and we've done this before when we borrowed money from the schools, is we phase it in over six years. You know, every two years we pay back another $500 million or something. So my guess is that's what's likely to happen. Well, and Barry, Senator Hartman touched on it a little bit. Um, we paid back, and Senator Pappas mentioned that the Republicans, with the good job they did with the budget the last two years, paid back all the shifted money from the last biennium and $700 million from the previous biennium. So the shift, um, you do hear the governor himself yeah. didn't include any payback in the last two years right. because of the great work the Republicans did in balancing the budget for the last two years. The shift is still at $1.1 billion. There's some more work. What you also need to realize, Senator Ortman mentioned that January was good. I think revenue up $140 million, yeah. whatever. That will automatically go back to reduce the school shift more as those good budget months come forward. If they continue to happen in February, March, April, May, and June, that's potentially going to automatically pay back that shift even more because we have already fully replenished our budget reserves and cash flow accounts up to in the neighborhood of a billion dollars. And, 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 and a lot of the school districts that when with the shift was done, they got hurt by it, but a lot of them are saying now, well, pay us, give us new money. The shift's happening, the payback of the shift's happening automatically because it's in statute already once we get the cash reserve, the, the cash, the cash, um, the cash reserve and the, and the, the rainy day fund filled back up, it automatically goes to pay back the shift. They want new money because they, they're seeing the economy's improving, our, our revenues are coming, are coming up, and so they're getting that paid back. So, um, and they get the biggest hit they take from that is when the shift happens, and they've already dealt with that in their budget. So now they're saying, well, we know it's going to get paid back eventually. We want money to take care of special ed costs and, and things like that. I think so. the governor does have a per pupil increase. Yeah. Anybody in education he does have yeah. a per yeah. pupil increase? And, and for me, that's actually a concern because when you do that, it is a commitment for a very long time. Those mm -hmm. per pupil allocations don't ever go away. Mm -hmm. And so there is some concern in economic times like this that adding more money into the per pupil formula will be, um, will be tough to keep up with. All right. Well, we have a viewer who's from Chisago County who's concerned about LGA. And if I'm understanding the viewer's question correctly, uh, he's concerned about uh, some of the decreases that have occurred in local government aid and, uh, and believes maybe that should be reversed. Who wants to talk about well, local St. Paul government? is pretty dependent on local government aid um, to pay for our police and fire. Um, and uh, there is an increase in the governor's budget, but it doesn't make up for the, all the cuts that happened over the last eight years. So we're still below that. And I think that's put pressure on property taxes in St. Paul. Uh, the, just the reductions um, due to the Republican governor in local government aid. Well, there hasn't really been a change in local government aid payments since 2009 when the governor went through on allotment, Governor Pawlenty. So the legislature maintained the local government aid payments to the cities that qualified from 2010 through the present. So I want to make sure that that's clear. The governor's proposal to add local government aid for the cities that get it, which is about half the, the population of the state of Minnesota, um, it, as I said, will get all eaten up with all the sales tax dollars that the cities are going to have to pay, and then some. So I, I think we should reform local government aid. We should go back to its original premise, which was to make sure that cities across the, the state can provide um, a basic and essential level of services to their residents. It shouldn't go beyond that. But we have cities like Winona, 64% of their budget, their annual budget comes from local government aid. And I think we need to recognize that there are cities that are very dependent on this money 
And then there are others like the city of Minneapolis that get huge amounts of LGA at the expense of others. So I think it needs to be reformed. We need to look at what we're trying to accomplish with the LGA and go back to that. I think there is a study that's coming out here in the next month or so with some recommendations on that. And some of the suburbs, the suburbs around my suburb 10 years ago had it. It got reduced, and then they haven't had it for the last 10 years. If the formula had been fully funded last year, we would have gotten it back. But that's one of the complaints that some of the suburbs have, the close-in suburbs, is that there's no predictability in it. It, mm -hmm. it goes up and down. And if, if, if we're going to reform it, we need to put some, some leveling in that because if it's going to go up one year, you're going to have it, and one year you're not. You can't f hire a cop on it if you're not going to get it the next year because now you're going to have to raise property taxes for it. But it has raised property taxes when it gets cut. The cities that have been getting it to either, either have to raise property taxes to make up for it or they have to cut basic services. So that's if, if we're going to reform it, we need to make sure we do something to level it out so it's not the wide, the wide fluctuations in it. Look, Reverend anything on that? No, I'm good. All right. <laughs> so, uh, and then we have last a question from a viewer who <coughs> excuse me, wants to know about whether or not there will be any constitutional amendments that are passed in this session. Um, Normally, of course, you we have uh, I, you know this would not be a year where they would be voted on. You don't vote until November of 2014. Any talk on that subject? Well, we've had and and the, they, they come through <coughs> government, government operations, and and so we've had four of them put in. But the funny thing is that the ones that, I, that have been put in so far of all are all constitutional amendments to change the way we do constitutional right. amendments. Right, that's what they um, are. Either raising it to have to pass on the floor of the House or the Senate, either a two-thirds vote or a three-fifths vote, mm -hmm. are the two uh, variations instead of the ones. Instead of just a majority. Instead, instead of just a uh, 51 or 51 percent majority. Too early to tell whether. Too early to tell, and, and we, there's no rush to do them this year, um, because if they, you know, if they don't have to get voted on, they're not on the ballot till next 2014. So we can take it up next year if there's a desire for it. We have run out of time. I want to thank my panel, uh, thank the panel tonight for answering the, the questions from the viewers. I want to thank the viewers for your participation, invite you to be back next week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature comes home for our, for our continuing programs on your legislators. We are, we're grateful to have you with us. We look forward to having you with us in the weeks ahead. Thank you and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members. Making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.